Welcome to Undersampled Radio, episode 12. We actually are broadcasting live today. It's pretty exciting. We're up on um, YouTube right now. We're on uh, Hangouts on air. So if you guys want to join us, uh, you can do so by clicking on the link in the software underground under sampled channel, and it will take you to our Undersampled Radio episode 12 page where you can ask questions of us or of our guest. Um, we have quite a bit of news for you today, and uh, I'm going to let Matt lead the charge in that respect. You're on. Uh, cool. Hi. How's it Hello. Going? Um, yeah, well, you know, it's the news is always just kind of what am I up to <laughs> from my point of view. Uh, I because I haven't been paying all that much attention outside of things. I guess um, I've been slightly distracted this week by the the live tweeting going on from the, the Oracle versus Google case, which we might get a chance to talk about a bit later. I blogged about it this week. Um, but it's another, another geeky copyright case. Uh, and then the other thing I'm just kind of completely submerged in right now is our latest, uh, you know, we do this, we're doing a sort of series of books, 52 things you should know about X, and uh, the latest one is rock physics. Uh, it's it sort of started off as geophysics part two because we already did geophysics. That was the first book we did, um, but it seems to have it, well it, early on it was kind of going in the quantitative kind of direction. So so I think it's going to be called 52 things you should know about rock physics. And um, we you know we had all the essays in ages ago, and 2015 was just so sort of depressing that somehow just working on the book just didn't quite happen. So so anyway, so we're, we're back in it now. It's going to be out in a few weeks. Um, we're just editing like crazy at the moment. Awesome. Uh, Where can yeah, we find and, it, by the way, when it comes out? Well, okay, so we, we publish these books. Like, we're the publisher. So I say we. That's like me and my wife, essentially, Kara, who is a uh, publishing guru. Um, so Agile Libra is the publishing company. But we publish them using Amazon's CreateSpace self-publishing platform, which is completely awesome. So um, it, basically, they do it's print on demand. So when you order a book from Amazon, um, and that, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of it, it uh, the, Amazon actually makes the copy right, right then. The, it is possible for bookshops and things to stock it. We don't sort of chase that market. It's so easy for us to do it through Amazon. We don't have to touch any inventory or do any fulfillment or touch orders or anything. Um, but people do sometimes order, like we give you discounts on bulk purchases if you want to like buy them for people. And yeah, we, 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 we do that kind of thing. So um, yeah, and in connection with that, I've just been reading a lot about some of the characters whose names pop up all the time in rock physics, like uh, Gassman and um, Bio and uh, Hashin and Strickman and these people, who I I just sort of realized in uh, reading the manuscript that I had no idea who any of these people were, so I've been reading a bit about them. Yeah, that guy has an equation or something, right? Yeah, exactly. It's actually remarkably hard to even find out what their first names were. <laughs> uh, like Gassman, uh, it, it took a little bit of sleuthing around. Um, oh, oh, and, and I just wanted to mention one more thing, because uh, we're talking to Mark Tingay next week, Australian Surprise! Geoscience. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be uh, awesome. I'm really looking forward to it. But he, so the connection, I guess, there's a sort of topical connection because next week is the 10th anniversary of Lumpur Lapindo, this huge mud, mud volcano in East Java in Indonesia. And um, the reason why you might want to be aware of that before it we get to it is because Mark's uh, been tweeting, sort of live tweeting, as the events on the well, the exploration well that partly caused this uh, eruption, or completely caused it, depending on point of view, uh, he's been sort of tweeting the events that led up to it, so mud losses, difficult drilling, cavings, this kind of thing, that may, in retrospect, have, that were, um, you know, early warning signs essentially. So it's kind of fun following his Twitter account right now. He's publishing lots of pictures and bits from the drilling reports and that kind of thing. 
Uh, so yeah, at Mark Tingay on Twitter. Awesome. Um, well, we you guys should definitely go check that out. Uh, he, as Matt says, there's a lot of cool multimedia stuff on there for you to see. But we also this week have another exciting guest for you, Matt. You're on again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Leah, Leah Uyeda, um I hope I'm not mangling your name too much. I, I remember you yeah. telling me how to pronounce it. Uh, yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. So. Yeah, you can. So he's a researcher in Rio. Um, now I heard someone pronounce Rio de Janeiro, what I would call Rio de Janeiro, uh, and a Brazilian pronounce it. And I was like, wow, I've, I've never heard it pronounced that way. So I'll let you give us a quick lesson in that as well. Um, researcher, teacher. I described him as an open sorcerer, and he really liked that. Um, <laughs> www.leouyeda.com, and he's on Twitter at. Leo Uyeda, so that's L-E-O-U-I-E-D-A, and um, yeah, Leo, welcome. Thanks, uh, it's great being here. Uh, first thing, the uh, yeah, port Brazilian Portuguese is terribly pronounced, so uh, uh, it that would be Rio de Janeiro. Okay, well, that's a, that sounds uh, okay. Yeah, but. I, my, I, I'm trying to have a bit of a neutral accent. Uh, uh, and is that yeah, where so you are right now? Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, in my bedroom, actually. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So, um, is it all getting exciting in this lead up to the Olympics? Um, yeah, exciting is one way to describe it. Uh, <laughs> There's been a lot of craziness happening lately. Yeah, it's uh, getting a bit scary here because um, oh. there, there's tons changing with the, the whole political situation here, um, and the state of Rio is particularly being affected because uh, it depends a lot on the oil industry, and since prices have just gone down and the whole thing with Petrobras, uh, so the revenue for the state is just gone way down. Uh, is that where you're hiding I, in the black box? Huh? Sorry? Is that where you're, you're locked away in, in a box, in a dark box there? <laughs> yeah, that, <laughs> basically because uh, since uh, I work at a public university and we're almost completely funded by the state and the state is broke, uh, so <laughs> we have absolutely no money. So um, are not even for those, for those of you guys who don't know who are listening, uh, uh, Leo has just finished his PhD, and in fact, he has already posted his paper to the Software Underground, um, and it's a fascinating paper, and I've uh, suggested that he repost it after this episode, so if you're looking for it, um, go on... Uh, sign up at uh, swung.rocks and you can go check out the paper. But uh, while we have you here, I guess a, a good lead-in question, other than how do you pronounce Rio de Janeiro, is uh, <laughs> what do you? What's your research in? What do you do? Um, I do mostly gravity and magnetic inverse problems. Uh, so it's trying to develop methods for doing the gravity and magnetic inversion. Um, so it's a lot of uh, linear algebra and uh, programming. Um, so it's mostly methods developed now. I'm trying to go more into doing some uh, cool app applications, um, which was a bit left. Uh, that, how do I say this? Um, yeah, I didn't do much of that during my graduate studies. I focused more in computing and uh, doing the actual methods, so uh, now I'm trying to do some applications of what I've been developing. Okay, so what's your edge? What's, what's uh, new about your research? Uh, for my PhD, what I was doing is uh, trying to do all the modeling in a spherical Earth, uh, so instead of pretending that everything is Cartesian, uh, just trying to do everything uh, as a sphere. Um, and then that poses all sorts of problems because then the forward modeling is not very straightforward. Uh, we don't have any analytical solutions, uh, which is the case for Cartesian. So um, 
that's something that I've been working on since 2008 uh, during my undergrad. Um, and how do I do this numerical uh, calculation? So that was the first part of my thesis. And the second part was getting the Ford modeling and trying to do uh, an inversion. Um, and the particular problem that I chose was to try to map the depth of the moho. Uh, so and in spherical coordinates, so that I could apply that to a large area. So uh, what I did then is try to calculate the moho for the whole of South America. And that's the second part. And when did uh, when did Fatiando sort of uh, come about? Was that something that you um, started yourself from scratch, or was it already a project when you uh, when you started there, or where did that come from? Uh, that was something that I always talked about with some friends uh, during my undergrad, because um, uh, the the year that I started, uh, there were a lot of people interested in computing. Which was a bit uh, odd. I mean, we we were not a typical class, I guess, in in that perspective, because uh, most people don't really care too much. Uh, now uh, things are changing a bit, but uh, so we always talked about trying to do something open source uh, for modeling everything, uh, because we were using all these uh, bad uh, programs, especially for gravity and magnetics. The I think it's called GravMag. Uh, it was a particularly, I mean, it's good. It's free, and a lot of people use it, but it's a bit dated. Uh, so we were trying to do something uh, uh, more up to date, but then that never got off the ground. We started doing that. Uh, we had even a project layout, uh, and all of that is in the version control history of the Fatiando repository. So if you go back to the first commits, uh, which I actually did uh, while preparing uh, my PhD thesis defense, uh, so I went back and tried to see what the evolution was. And we started out as trying to do this forward modeling, 2D forward modeling program. That didn't work out. Um, and then when I came to Rio to do my master's, um, I started developing all these um, like these little Python functions to do uh, forward modeling and implement stuff that I was learning in my classes and trying to do my thesis. So I figured that I could maybe restart the project and make it a library instead of just an application. Right. Tell and us, that's now, that, basically now that we've got the started. history, tell us a little bit about uh, what Fatiando is for those of us who don't know. Okay, so uh, Fatiando is a library. A Python library uh, for modeling and inversion in geophysics. So it basically is a bunch of functions and classes uh, that try to automate um, some common tasks uh, in modeling. So if I, uh, and most of it right now is for potential fields, so gravity and magnetics. I started developing some seismic stuff, but that uh, is still uh, in beta. <laughs> Um, and for the gravity and magnetics part, you can do uh, forward modeling using uh, rectangular prisms. You can do more complex polygonal bodies. Uh, there's all the tesseroid stuff, which is um, the modeling star coordinates. Um, and it has um, some processing utilities, so you can do upward continuation, calculate derivatives do some interpolation. There's uh, some more advanced uh, gravity and magnetic stuff, like um, there's a technique called the equivalent layer, uh, which is you do some, it's kind of an inversion that you can do, and then you do some forward modeling uh, in order to do interpolation and calculate derivatives uh, and things like that. Uh, there's also Euler deconvolution. And there's some stuff for plotting all, all of that in 3D using Mayavi, um, which depends on using VTK. And converting objects to VTK is not something that you want to do all the time, because uh, the syntax is a bit uh, complex. Uh, so there are some functions that convert the uh, Fatiando objects uh, for like prisms and stuff. It converts it to VTK and plots it in Mayavi. 
Right. These, these are like 3D plotting, uh, 3D visualization libraries, right? Yeah. Or frameworks. Exactly. Okay. What does so Fatiambo mean uh, in English? Uh, Fatiambo Terra means slicing the earth. Uh, that's why the logo is this little uh, earth all sliced. Uh, I think that's written on the website somewhere. I'm not sure if, if uh, and we'll, the latest we'll have a link to kept it. We'll have a link to the show notes in. I mean, we'll have a link to Fatiando in the show notes if you if you want to check them out. Um, that that'll be posted on. It's already posted on Swan. Um, what, now that you've finished your PhD, what are you going to do? What are you doing currently? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, right <laughs> now, I'm just trying to uh, get my projects organized. Um, and since the university is on strike for two months now, and it doesn't look like it's going to end before the Olympics, uh, so now it's the, the, I'm trying to focus on research. Uh, so I, I have two undergrad students that are doing research with me. Um, I'm trying to uh, develop Fatiando a bit more. and. Yeah, trying to get some old stuff out uh, and published uh, things that I started doing my PhD and then uh, my PhD got in the way and <laughs> I had to stop it. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. And waiting for the semester to finally start and then start classes again. What do you teach? Um, right now I teach uh, two intro geophysics courses. Because um, the university here, it only has a geology program. It doesn't have a, a geophysics program. Uh, so I teach um, two intro geophysics. One is gravity and magnetics. The other one is seismics, uh, electric methods, and electromagnetics. And I also teach a introduction to computing and numerical calculus. And that is for the oceanography degree. Uh, so it's good that I can have contact with both uh, students. They have very different uh, profiles. The, the oceanography people tend to like uh, math a bit more <laughs> than the geology majors. Uh, that's really cool. Um, on this, uh, since you mentioned calculus, um, I'm reading this awesome book at the moment called Burn Math Class. I think it's by Jason Wilkies, if I remember rightly. I could double check that. Um, who is a, I think he's a student, a PhD student of sort of, sort of math and psychology, I believe, if I'm remembering right. And Evan recommended this book to me. It's so awesome. Like, I really, uh, really recommend it. Do check it out. He ba basically completely deconstructs mathematics, starts from addition and multiplication and sort of derives calculus first wow. and then sort of trigonometry and logarithms and even some geometric stuff from that sort of beginning. You see, and his, his point is that you can't get to the what are often called the prerequisites for calculus, things like trigonometry, mm -hmm. you need calculus in order to understand them. I just sort of love his uh, thesis, and it's a really quirky book. So yeah. Anyway, just a, cool. just a tip for I mean, any, any time I hear someone's teaching maths, I'm like, okay, you have to read this book because it's <laughs> I haven't read anything like it before. It's really good. Um, do you do you so you're you're teaching a bit of computation? Like, do, is do you think um, Fatiando as much a teaching tool potentially as it is a a research tool? Uh, definitely, uh, I use it. Uh, I don't use it in my computation class, but I use it for all my geophysics classes. So okay. a, a lot of the functionality in Fatiando is, um, especially in the seismic module, uh, which doesn't have much, uh, but there are a lot of simplified problems right. that are great for, for teaching basic concepts. Um, and uh, I also try to use... Uh, because the, the classes, the geophysics classes are divided in uh, some theoretical classes and labs. Uh, the labs are in my computer lab, uh, where I have uh, Python and everything installed. And then I give them um, a Jupyter notebook that explores some concept, like the thing that I'm teaching that week. 
Uh, and then I use the Fatiando forward modeling and the uh, processing uh, routines uh, together with the IPython widgets so that then the students, they can interact with the code uh, so they, they don't have to program anything. I give them everything already. They just have to run the notebook and then they get these slider widgets uh, and then they can test things like um, how does the magnetic anom anomaly vary if you vary the inclination and declination of the geomagnetic field? Uh, what happens when you do upward continuation? How far up can you go? Uh, what happens if you in increase the level of noise in the data? Uh, for the seismics part, I was using uh, an experimental part of Fatiando for the, for, uh, it's a finite difference modeling. Uh, and then that, that code, you can run a simulation for uh, an acoustic simulation, or you can also run a, um, uh, a, a fully elastic simulation. So you can get PNSV waves uh, on one of the simulations. So then they can, I can build them a model, and then I can show them, look, this is a P wave. And look at how the uh, look at how it's vibrating. So you can see that the P wave is vibrating along the propagation direction. You can see the S waves vibrating uh, perpendicular. Uh, you can see what happens if you make a P wave. Um, if you just generate a P wave and make it uh, reflect off of uh, an interface, and then uh, the simulation generates S waves uh, as well. So that's pretty cool. So I I can cool. give them the simulation and then ask a question and say, oh, what, what happens when uh, the P wave hits an interface? What's the angle of incidence? And you can see the angle in the simulation. Uh, so then they can calculate uh, uh, what's the reflection angle for an S wave and for a P wave, is it different? Uh, so I, I generally just give them the, no the notebook and a bunch of questions. And then they have to go through the notebook and use the interactive stuff, discuss among themselves, and answer the questions. Mm. That, that sounds like an awesome teaching methodology. I wish that when I was in school, we had a, a bit more uh, self-guided uh, pace-as-you-go work where you could actually, as a student, get invested a bit in your projects and, and experiment some. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, that's why I'm doing this, because uh, the classes that I learned the most in university were usually the ones where the professor gave me something to do, and then I, I had to get that done. Uh, so then you go and study with a focus instead of just studying for an exam, and then you have no idea what all that is about, mm -hmm. uh, what it's for. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And the students love it. Um, I mean, at least I'm getting. Uh, I tried to do some uh, a survey and what what they liked, what they didn't like after they graduated. Um, most of them just they loved the practical classes. Um, most of the complaints were that sometimes they were too long because uh, the first time you do it, then uh, it's kind of hard to make it fit in the the class schedule. But right. Uh, but yeah, the the students loved uh, the interactive exercises. Excellent. It's a great idea. Hey, Matt, why don't you tell us about uh, Google versus Oracle? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I'm just sort of interested in this uh, this case because um, uh, the contention is not over like the copying of code, but it's over the copying of the the interface to the code, the API, the application programming interface. So it's it's about um, it's almost like claiming that the user interface for programmers is how I described it in this blog post is um, was was copyrightable, and it's kind of interesting partly because um, there's nine billion dollars worth of damages being sought by by Oracle, um, and, and partly because the case was already essentially the, the court already determined that the API wasn't copyrightable and that Google was in the clear and they Google had a fair use claim which was moot I guess once they decided it wasn't copyrightable in the first place um, 
but but this this was um, turned around by the uh, the court of appeals, and so now it's back in the district court, but this time with a jury. And so the interesting thing there is that none of the jury have any technology experience. You know, they're ordinary sort of citizens, if you like, with no no knowledge of programming or what an API is. And I guess I, the the reason why I kind of put it in the show notes for today with Leo was just because. The implications for just how software works and open source and stuff that's on the web uh, could be quite profound if if Oracle wins. You know, there there could be a real um, gold rush essentially of people claiming that their APIs were were copied. Um, I mean, and and I guess it's especially relevant to to bring up with Leo because. The, the reason why I kind of connected with Leo in the first place, well, I think it was through Twitter, right, Leo, if I recall? Yeah, maybe probably. It was Fatty uh, Actually, I bet it what it was, was on, my, on the plane on the way to an open source conference or a workshop in Copenhagen at EAGE in 2012, I built this um, uh, wiki, Wikipedia page with all the open source geophysics software I could find. And Fatiando would have been on there, and I probably wrote to you saying, "Can you just check that I've got all the license and all of that stuff right?" I'm just guessing, but I bet that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, th that happened. I, I don't know if that was the first time. Uh, okay, maybe, yeah. But probably, yeah. So I know Leo as a real open source advocate, um, who you know is sort of one of these people who does reproducibility really well. It's sort of built into Leo's research. If you go and check out his website, you'll see, you know, his, and when he, d he did one of the early tutorials in the Leading Edge, and, uh, you know, he's like, not just, oh yeah, here's my code, but it's like, here's my manuscript, and here's all my figures, and here's like, all these scripts that regenerate everything. And um, so that that was why I kind of brought it up today. So, I don't know, Leo, have you been, have you been following that case at all, and what do you think about the implications for uh, for API copying, uh, I wasn't following it until you you um, wrote your post, and then after that, I was reading some stuff about it. Uh, yeah, and then it could really be a problem because uh, th there are a lot of, uh, especially if the, if the web API is copyrightable, then probably all APIs are copyrightable. Right. Uh, so then. I, I would probably have some problem with that because the inversion uh, package, the, the inverse problems package in Fatiando, it copies the scikit-learn API. Uh, right. Yeah, it, it's not an, an exact copy, but it's definitely, I mean, there, there's no denying that it's inspired because scikit-learn is one of the best uh, libraries out there. Uh, yeah, Python. and the, the sort of... The selling point, almost, of Scikit-Learn, which is a Python library for machine learning, mm -hmm. it is that the API is the same, <laughs> and yeah. lots of other people have copied it too, in their packages. Mm -hmm. right? I think the last thing exactly is, uh, a Scikit-Learn-like API for TensorFlow, which is Google's deep learning uh, mm -hmm. library, and yeah, okay, so that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so that that could and I, I imagine there are a lot of other cases where you have an open source alternative that copies the API of some uh, proprietary software. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, I'm <laughs> guessing. Uh, I mean, I don't really know too much about this, but I, I'm guessing the uh, open source NVIDIA uh, drivers for for Linux. I think it's called Novo or something like that. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's probably copying something uh, related to the interface, uh, and yeah, then that that might be illegal. <laughs> after that. Right? Yeah, it's it's interoperability, right? Is the, yeah. the reason why people do this um, mm -hmm. so that we can have nice things? <laughs> oh man! Why are you doing all this uh, legal research, Matt? <laughs> if you can say <laughs> on air. <laughs> I have a lot of time in jail. Uh, just, <laughs> I don't know, the, uh, you know, the GSI thing I'd been following on and off for a while, and partly just because of all the 
issues around open data and open seismic data. Um, yeah, don't know. I've, I don't think I'd used the legal tag on the blog before, so I don't think I've blogged about legal stuff before. Maybe once or twice about copyright type issues and uh, open access. It's one of those things that, I mean, I don't know what, what your experience is, Leo, but I mean, people, people are sort of, I don't know. For, I know it's kind of a boring subject, but most people are really quite ignorant of copyright, what's okay to reuse, what isn't. I mean, I was reading some law blog the other day, and I swear it was completely full of basically illegally <laughs> reproduced images as illustration through the blog posts. And, and you go to any talk, and I mean, it's full of copyright images with without attribution or whatever. And I don't know. I've, I've, yeah, it's kind of hard to get started on that because no, I, I mean, I, I, I probably do some stuff like that uh, without knowing. Uh, yeah, and, uh, it's hard not to, right? It's so easy to copy yeah. an image or whatever. Sure. And, and now it's really there, there are no chlor. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, and there are no classes about that. If no, you guys well, exactly. a bit about it, you can go check out Agile's post. You can go check out Matt's post on on agilegeoscience.com. It's it's fascinating, and uh, I, I urge you to check it out, especially if you do uh, publishing of any kind, especially scientific or, in this case, reproducible with yeah. APIs. And and you know, part of it, like just sorry, just to finish that, like why do I care? Is 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 because. Um, you know, those of us who publish things op openly, there are still terms and conditions attached to open source licenses and open access content, Creative Commons, so on and so forth. And we, you know, we would like people to respect the terms and conditions in those open licenses too. And so I sort of feel like and this. This is why I don't. I don't know if you guys have heard of SciHub, but it's this sort of. Um, I, sh I shouldn't have told you what it was called because it's kind of awesome, but I really disagree with it on a profound level. So basically, SciHub is this place you can go where if you can't get hold of a paper because it's behind a paywall or whatever, you can put the DOI into SciHub and they've probably already downloaded it. So you can have the PDF for free. So it's completely illegal. It's Russian, you know, not I, I believe, maybe Ukrainian or something. But anyway, it's from this sort of Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe. And... Um, and I really disagree with it, not because, I mean, I like the idea of making research accessible, like scientific research should be accessible. I agree with the premise, if you like. But just violating the terms of service isn't, I don't think, the way to go about solving that problem. I think the way to go about it is to aggressively, basically, completely just embrace open access stuff and say, I'm just going to ignore the closed literature. Like, if it's behind sure. a paywall, I guess it's off. Like, we don't, I don't read papers in Chinese either. So, do you know what I mean? It's not like you don't already ignore a whole bunch of literature. Um, so, yeah. I just sort of feel like, just stop citing it. Stop reviewing papers that are going behind a paywall and start publishing things with an open license. Like, that's how you, that's how we get progress. End but of there, There's a bit of a problem with that. Uh, Damn. I mean, not not reviewing for for uh, paywall journals, that is okay. I mean, sure we can do that because we don't get paid anything to review anyway, and <laughs> we get nothing actually. I, I mean, you you get uh, you get like knowledge of the current trends in research and stuff like that, but you don't really get much out of doing reviews. So. But publishing only open access can be a financial problem sometimes. Mm. Um, so if you want, I mean, for I, I wouldn't publish in geophysics, for example, if it uh, if I had to do it open access, because the publishing fee I think is two thousand uh, yep. dollars, and uh, in in with the current ex exchange rate for me, it's just impossible. <laughs> mm. Mm. Uh, all, all of the money from a grant would go into publishing one or two papers. Right. Um, so th that's not always an option. Uh, I know that uh, PLOS One usually gives, uh, they, they can give you a waiver on the fee, but that's not guaranteed. Um, 
there are some EGU journals which are, are open access and they're not very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they are great. They have this new uh, open review uh, system. But it, it usually costs more. Uh, even if it doesn't cost too much, it, it costs more than nothing, which is sometimes sure. what you pay for, for a paywall. Um, so that, that can be a bit of a problem of just going open all the way right now. Uh, not everybody can pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and no, not I, everybody can get away with it. Yeah, right, right. No, I hear you. And th these are all problems, I guess, with these sort of transitional things, right, where there's, an in there's a sort of incumbent system where right now we're all just spending, I mean, if you're an institution, you're spending tons and tons of money on publications. It's just that you do it after mm -hmm. publication. Right, yeah. because you subscribe to all of these journals and so on, so it's just like right now it's it the, the everything's kind of backwards, um, mm -hmm. and right now all of the sort of publishing, uh, you know, the channels are through Elsevier and Wiley and so on, and who have these have overhead and have these. Um, these cost structures in place already. So in, until we get an emergence of open access publishers and etc. Cetera, etc., cetera, uh, it, it is going to be going to be this weird middle space. I mean, I'd love to see organizations like SEG like really getting behind like how can we make it more accessible, especially to people outside of the US or who don't have a lot of industry support for their research. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's a big. I think it's a it's an exciting time, right, to be in. Science for all sorts of reasons, the technology yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and everything, and the publication changing is one of them. Well, we mm -hmm. will put some links to open access publishing on the show notes, so go check it out if you don't know about it. Um, it's certainly something that you should look into. In many cases, there are some cost prohibitive options, but in many cases, those the the costs out, outweigh the uh, the benefits outweigh the costs. So, um, with that, I want to say, Leo, thanks for coming on the show. It was great to have you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you, Leah. All right, guys, we'll catch you next week with Mark Tingay on Undersampled Radio. Thanks. Bye. Cheerio.